launched again from out of the sky. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No! It's the great pinochle player. Uh, with just the slight knife edge of insecurity here. Oh, we've received a note that uh, one of the networks has bought the TV rights to the next contest between Lord Windersmere and Paul Boomer, the famous Australian... Uh, oh, I think that would be fine. I think it would be fantastic show. Uh, immediately followed... Well, in, uh, in one of the big wide, wide world of sports shows, you know, after the uh, automobile crash derby, or uh, after they have the uh, Christians where they feed them to the lions. It's too bad that TV wasn't around. That would be on the wide, wide world of sports with the lions and, you know, the whole bit. I think a fantastic show. You'd have Bud Bud down there interviewing the lions. And it's too bad that uh, that Captain Ahab was around before the wide, wide world of sports. Bud Palmer would be on the forecastle there next to Ahab questioning who's ahead there. The whale is four points behind. Uh, Lord Windishmere, yes. I'll award you the brass figligy with bronze oak leaf palm if you can describe to me the official costume worn by the performers. And and I'll, another thing, too, this traditional, fantastic sporting event was preceded and always has been preceded by the blowing of a traditional horn. You know the name of that horn. We'll find out what kind of a sport fan you are. Uh, <laughs> and if you do give me the name, we will know what kind of a sport fan you are. <laughs> All together, gang. That's it. Hold it there. That's it. Very good. That was very nice. You brought that up nicely there. All right, George, you can always tell a pro. Well, we've got, <laughs> got a lot of things here to worry about. You know, uh, speaking of... Uh, uh, do you mind if I sing to you a modern folk song? You do mind. Well, all right, I won't then. Now, as a matter of fact, it won't do you any good to mind at all because I'm in charge here and got a face who is in charge once in a while. Uh, I think uh, we should preface this with a little uh, pseudo-folk type music. I'm proud to live in West Virginia. Them other states can't hold a lick to us. But now I must relate what's happening in our state. By God, it's really causing quite a fuss. Chorus. The interstate is coming through my outhouse. They tell me that I'm on there right away. I'll sell to them and I'll get rich. But my path will end at the highway ditch. I'm making my last visit there today. That's the big problem out there. No, that's a fact. Uh, uh, most uh, folk singers that I know down in the village are usually singing about problems that have long since disappeared or problems that everybody knows about, you know, like uh, CCC workers, stuff like, uh, you know, they're singing about. I heard one guy who was, who was a mere beardless youth of 17 singing uh, a sad folk song about the NRA. And I thought that was kind of, you know, kind of significant about it. Uh, you want to hear, Granny says to cancel Sears and Roebuck, tell Wally's boys to hurry up our dole with all this progress coming, we'll change to inside plumbing and shorten up our early morning stroll. <laughs> Them engineers made 47 surveys. They said to put it there, and that was that. They'll bing a big steamroller and flatten my two-holer, but I'll keep right on a-votin' Democrat. 
<laughs> now, those are the real problems that are affecting guys in West Virginia. The interstate is coming through. The mayor, he met with all the city council. They took a vote to see what they'd allow. They said it was a pity to mess up our fair city, but spite of that, it's coming anyhow. It's on its way. They're going to buy the West Virginia Turnpike. They'll straighten out the curves, is what they say. But it ain't very wide. Along that mountainside, they'll have to double-deck it all the way. See, they sing folk songs about about the highway. This is genuine. This, by the way, this comes from West Virginia, this song that I'm singing to you. And out there, where the folk really are folk, uh, they they sing about the problems that really affect them. The highway and the interstate that's coming to take along that old two-holer. Uh, you want to hear more of this? Let's see. We voted them $200 million. They'll spend it all, I'm sure, before they're done. But ain't nobody knows where all that money goes. I hope it ain't the State House Flower Fund. <laughs> that's uh, thinly veiled sarcasm. Someday when I grow old and kind of feeble, one moonlit night I'll wake up feeling strange. I'll finish up my bath and stroll down my old path and wake up in a great big interchange. <laughs> he doesn't get it. Well, that's, he's never had to go out in the backyard. And uh, that's uh, the problem. Of course, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I, I often wonder why, why people don't really sing folk songs about stuff that really bothers them. I've invented about a half dozen of them. I wish I brought my guitar here tonight. I bought the, uh, the lonesome letter from the White Castle. Uh, <laughs> you want to hear that one so much? Yeah, I wish we could get away with that one. Because the things that really bother people, uh, we rarely mention, rarely talk about. Uh, I wonder, I've often wondered, in fact, what uh, a guy sitting with his feet hanging down there and he's in the shipping dock, you know, at the Youngstown Sheet and Tube, way out there where the steel mills are wild and woolly, and the, the foreman is breathing down his neck with a breath of fire, and all he can hear all around him is the sound of those vast open house belching and wheezing and snorting flame and fire. I wonder what he would think if he was confronted with the, with the, uh, with the hard-bitten laboring man who sings every night of the trials and tribulations of the common folk at the bitter end, you know? Oh, Bob Dylan, he's fist fought his way from coast to coast, just a fist fighting and a hollering and yelling for dimes and nickels. And how long, how many roads can a man travel before he's a tired, weak, sad man who sees the world as a great... Well, it's pretty long and hard and difficult sometimes, I'll admit. But you know, this problem of being able to see other people uh, is, is not as simple as it seems at uh, first glance. How many of you are fans of English newspapers and wonder about, of course, one of the things that you run into in English newspapers constantly is the English attitude towards America. It's almost exactly the opposite of the American's attitude towards England. That it's almost impossible to find an article anywhere in America of any kind, any stripe, that is anything but just almost totally laudatory about the English. Uh, England, the English, uh, the whole, you know, the whole scene. It's almost impossible uh, to find anyone who will write any other way. In fact, if you did, you'd be called chauvinistic. You'd be called a ridiculous, uh, non-cosmopolitan, uh, right-wing, foolish, silly, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you would. I mean, if, you do, if you do this. And yet, on the other hand, in England, it is almost impossible to find an article about America that's, that's the other way. And somebody sent me a review. It's a very funny review. Uh, what do you think it would be? How do you think an Englishman writing, or an English person, in this case an English woman, writing a novel that's set in America, what kind of a novel do you think they'd write? I mean, how would they write it? Well, you can't believe it. It's almost impossible to believe. Would you please give me a little stars and stripes there for a minute there to set the scene? It's America we're talking about. And the 
the title of this book about America is A Season in Hell. And the review is by Mr. Norman Shrapnel, who's a famous British reviewer. Whether or not shocking, like Jane Austen, as Mr. Isherwood wrote of her last novel, is a fair description of Alison Lurie's talents, the nowhere city, a season in hell, certainly reveals her as a very astute and watchful writer. The city is Los Angeles, hellish in its perpetual summer, a tyranny of freeways, world shrine of the motor god. Domestic bliss in this setting is brutish and short. Allergic to the prevailing smog, a wife with psychosomatic ailments takes to her bed while her husband takes to somebody else's. He is in a difficult security job, a security job in which he is understandably despised by the beatniks, among whom her mistress has her lair. Total disruption ensues. Everybody disappears in the gritty haze of Los Angeles, a season in hell. Yes, this is a perceptive writer. <laughs> oh, boy. We are loved by our cousins across the sea. You know, I can, I, can you imagine me writing a novel with the setting in London? And, uh, and you could call it, uh, Oh, boy, I don't know whether you've been in London lately, especially if you've been around, uh, well, certain circles in London. Uh, you could write, you could write a pretty interesting, uh, a pretty interesting, uh, I think I could call my, uh, I have an idea for my novel. Uh, you could call it, uh, Richard the Lionhearted in High Heels. <laughs> and of course, you could start out by talking about uh, this this dismal, fog-ridden city with its despicable, despicable, ridiculous, rotten food. It's uh, it's continually whining and sniveling people who have a constant cold on the head due to the climate, who take the drugs regularly. Even the Parfumo scans look like childish, ridiculous byplay compared to what goes on behind the shuttered curtains in fashionable Mayfair. Our hero, married to... <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and people would, would be very irritated if I wrote that. As an American, I'd say, what right do you have? Uh, speaking of uh, the chauvinistic, this is WOR, AM and FM, New York. Would you please hit the big button there, please? There it is. Miller High Life, the bright beer. Miller High Life, the champagne of bottled beer. There's only one champagne of bottled beer. Sparkling. Flavorful, distinctive, Miller Highlight. Royal Casu. Only in Milwaukee, from a century old recipe, Miller Highlight has a rich heritage and tradition. A bright, clear taste, unequaled, unquestioned, unchanging. Available on tap, in cans, and in the familiar crystal clear bottle. Miller Highlight is always sparkling. Flavorful, distinctive. Enjoy Miller High Life yourself. Miller High Life, the champagne of bottled beer. Yes, Miller High Life, the champagne of bottled beer. Pop. That reminds me, uh, I, I came across something that, uh, that I, uh, Oh yeah, we got some commercials here before we do anything else. Let's see. Uh, uh, you got that uh, Star Spangled Banner type music up there? Keep it, keep it at ready here. It's uh, George Washington's birthday. Please hit it there. Please hit it there. A special reminder from Lofts: the big George Washington birthday sale. A famous Lofts chocolate cordial cherries is on right now. You know, someday, uh, if I may, uh, suddenly. Uh, deviate here from the commercial. Someday I'm going to tell the story of a 
tremendous hang-up that I once got on these ridiculous cherries, these chocolate-covered cherries with the cordials. Well, wait a minute. Let me tell you what I got hung up on, though. I got hung up on the juice. And my mother, one time, got a box of these things, and I discovered that if you took the, the, the chocolate out and you punched a hole in the bottom with a pin, you could suck the stuff right out. And, and and she got a, a, a gift of about a two-pound box of these from, from somebody. It was, you know, a big uh, Valentine's Day gift or something. And I went through this box of, of cherries. I figured no one would discover it, you see, because, because you know, it, it, it's very hard to tell. And I, I took this box of cherries out one afternoon, and I went with a pin, and I'd stick... Ooh, wow. It just comes right out, you know. And I'd put it back in the little the little tray, you know, the little paper tray, the little brown tray. I'd stick it back, and then I'd dry it off the bottom very carefully and smooth the chocolate over and put it back. And oh, boy, that stuff. I drank the cordial out of a whole two-pound box of those ridiculous cherries one time. And I remember my mother, and you know, I sat there with, with this awful conscience later. My mother's eating this, and she keeps saying to my father, who gave her, you know, gave her this thing. She says, you know, these are very good, except, well, I like them a little juicier. She said, they're, they're, they are kind of dry. <laughs> I'm sitting there. And, and this, this stuff, uh, uh, there is another kind of, of, of cordial that, uh, that I'm sure these are not, but there is another kind that has the real stuff in it. And I was about 15 or 16 when I discovered there is such a thing and it had rum in it. And, of course, by that time, I was a confirmed uh, spiker of uh, cordial-filled chocolates. I never really ate the whole chocolate. I used to always, you know, suck that thing out, and we got a box of rum-flavored ones. And, boy, did I get hooked. Oh, man. Oh, it led, it led me down the primrose path. All the way down. Here I am at OR now. You have no idea where I would have been with my fantastic talent and spectacular technique if I hadn't run into those rum cordial cherries at a crucial moment in my life. Talk about lost weekends. I would go reading around the house with cordial cherries hidden in the chandelier, you know, screaming and yelling with bats. For now, let's get on with this. Let's see. Don't miss out on the spectacular special. You could save 50 cents on each box of 27 big, plump, juicy maraschino chocolate cordial cherries that you buy. They're regularly a buck forty-nine a box. Right now, only 99 cents. But the sale ends soon. After February 28th, it's back to a buck forty-nine. So get yourself all chocolate cherried up. Well, you can still afford it. That's at Lofts, L-O-F-T-S, or wherever Lofts chocolates are sold. <laughs> hey, uh, another thing. Have you ever found anybody when you buy these uh, uh, boxes of chocolates that are, uh, well, you know, mixed chocolates, uh, the, the assortment of chocolates, have you ever found anybody who likes the chocolates that come that have the hard inside, that have the hard uh, sort of rubbery kind of uh, half-baked caramel insides? You like those? Well, good. I know a place where you can get a lot of them awful cheap. Anywhere where, where discriminating candy lovers are, you'll do all right. <laughs> do you agree with me, Matt? They're awful. I used to, that was another one. I was a confirmed biter of candy. And many a times my mother say, who bit the whole top layer? <laughs> She'd come in there be teeth, you know. <laughs> I'd say, not me. She'd say, come here, let me check. She knew, she knew just exactly whose teeth curved which way. My kid brothers curved one way, you know, she'd say, they fit yours. You've been biting the candy again. Uh, but th this, uh, <laughs> you know that they came out. They had to do away with it though, Matt. They came out with a candy in Chicago. Uh, candy seems to be bigger in the Midwest than it is here. I don't know why. There, there were a, at least a dozen big candy chains that operated throughout Chicago. I mean, really big quality candy stores. They were on every other block. There was, uh, all right, I'll, I'll, see, I'll really put a test to you. How many of you, uh, I'm, I'm talking about the outsiders, the guys who come from Chicago. What was the most famous candy chain? In Chicago, had an odd name, and it started out. The last name was Candies. No, no, no. A lot of them don't uh, don't. Uh, no, it, it rhymed. The first name rhymed with it. Somebody's Candies. 
That's a great name. And everybody used to crowd down there. By the, and whenever you came to a chick's house and you had a box of candy from this place, that meant you were serious, boy. You were not fooling around. And there, there was a whole hierarchy of where you got your candy when you were going on a date. If you came, you know, or a big date, when you bring candy or send it for a gift or something. A whole hierarchical setup. If you gave one kind of candy, that meant you were really all out. And that's the kind I'm talking about. If you gave another kind, that meant, well, you kind of like the chick and you like good candy, but it's not like uh, tatamount to making a statement. Uh, and then, uh, do you know that the turtles originated in Chicago? Have you ever heard of Demet's turtles? Well, the turtle, that's, that's a Chicago outfit. And the, these turtles originated in Chicago, and, and uh, it became a mania in that town, a, an absolute literal mania. People were just, uh, you'd see them sitting in the streetcars and in buses, everywhere else. Everyone would be eating Demet's turtles. They were just, uh, suddenly it caught on just like, uh, like bubble gum or something catches on. Everyone was going Demet's turtle nutty. And uh, t uh, candy seems to be bigger out there than it is here. Now, I don't know why. Here, cafeterias are bigger. <laughs> there, they don't have many cafeterias. The cafeteria is extremely rare in Chicago. Uh, in fact, there were only one or two major cafeterias in midtown Chicago. The whole big thing, Loop. There was a place called the Forum, which uh, was the big cafeteria there. But here, of course, every other block, there's a giant cafeteria. And when I came, first came to New York, that's what really hit me. The idea of all these cafeterias. Uh, people are not used to standing in line in Chicago, you know, picking their own food in the cafeteria. It's just, it's hardly ever done. Uh, there are a couple of little places where it's done, but not any, not many of the big places. Oh, another thing too that got me was the lack of giant drugstores in New York. Do you know that as you go further west, the drugstore gets more elaborate? Until finally you get all the way out in California, the drugstore looks a little bit like Saks. Fifth, that gigantic, fantastic setup. I mean, they've got everything there. You can, the whole scene. A drugstore maybe four stories high, and it'll have a furniture department, and it'll have, oh, I mean, really? Have you ever been in Schwab's in LA? Wow. Well, in Chicago, uh, and in that area, the idea of the drugstore, maybe people were more drugstore conscious. Uh, the drugstore was more of a social thing in the Midwest than it is here. The candy store never was a big deal in the Midwest as a social bit. When I came out here, you know, all the guys talk about hanging around the candy store. Nobody hung around a candy store in Chicago. It just wasn't done. Oh, the candy store was a place where you went to buy tablets. You know, that's about the end of it. You never, you never hung around with George the Greek who ran a candy store. You'd get out of there as quick as you could, as a matter of fact. But here, the candy store is the deal. Out there, the drugstore. Everybody, from the age of about, well, you know, the hanger around their types. Uh, the Marty types, you know. The guys around here, they'd be hanging around in diners and stuff like that. From, the, from about the time you're maybe 15 on up to about the time you're 25 and get drummed out at a drugstore. About that time, the drugstore is the deal. And what was the, what is the national drink? Of outside of New York, the national drink of the drugstore hanger arounders. It is just, it is automatic. You just come in. No, it is not just a Coke. Huh? Well, you're getting close. The lemon Coke. Lemon Coke or cherry Coke, if, uh, if it's a particular a fate type. Uh, but it, in general, the lemon Coke was the big deal out there. And nobody ever would buy a Coke in the bottle there. Because, you know, you can't get a lemon Coke out of the bottle. So you just come in and say, hey, Otto, give me a lemon Coke. And you'd say, okay. You want a little bigger or large or small? And you'd say, ah, oh, come on, give me a Coke. And uh, he'd whip up the, the big one always, and he'd bring it. And, uh, of course, you used to, yeah, come on, watch the ice there, Otto. You see, the more ice you put in the Coke, the less Coke you get. And sometimes you just buy four, you know, four pounds of ice. You'd sit there with about dropping a half a Coke. <laughs> and uh, that was the national drink. And everyone would sit. Of course, the, 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 the big, there was a, a definite social hierarchy between the people who sat in the booths and the guys that sat at the counter. Definite split right down the line. And they never changed. I mean, a, a counter sitter was a counter sitter. There'd be four guys in leather jackets and satin jackets sitting at the counter, and there were a couple of chicks. 
and they they were not the booth type. Now, when you go out into Chicago, uh, again, getting into the uh, the drugstore area there, in, in Chicago, say, for example, the big Walgreens drugstore on Randolph Street. Uh, yeah, it's at State and Randolph. There is a gigantic drugstore there that has it has a basement. You wouldn't even know what to do with a drugstore here. There's a basement to it. It has a it has a uh, a tea room like affair, or sort of like the Rose Gentian room, where you go down there and you sit there, and they have, the walls are painted pink. Yeah, even in our town, the drugstore had a place called something like the Plantation Room, connected to the drugstore. Believe it or not, where you if you really wanted to be classy, you could go drink your lemon coke in the Plantation Room. And eat your tuna salad sandwich back there. <laughs> and, and the drugstore is not uh, at all. Uh, uh, you know, you may think if you walk around here and you go into these drugstores around Times Square, you may think that you're in the big time. But let me tell you, most drugstores in this area, right here on Times Square, would be drugstores in little, in small towns in the Midwest. Uh, why? I don't know. It's a different social milieu completely. We do not know uh, the Midwesterner is is confused when he gets in in uh, cafeterias because he's not used to them. And not confused so much as as amused, interested. Uh, you, have you noticed how many uh, tourists will will go down and will stand in line in cafeterias and talk and say, "Hey, what do you want, Charlie? Hey, look at all the stuff. Hey, Fred, you know." And they run back and forth because it's a it's an experience. It's a real experience to them. They're used to being waited on. Uh, they're used to sitting down at a table and uh, having somebody come over and say, what do you have, baby? You know, that kind of stuff. But as you go further west, also there is another thing that uh, is not part of the eastern landscape. You have to travel 150 miles from around the New York City area to come across a genuine, true American drive-in. Now, I'm not talking about the movie. They, we think in terms of the movie drive-in here. I'm talking about the drive-in, Dad, where there'll be 45,000 cars. There'll be a whole, you've seen them, Matt. There'll be a whole field of cars. I mean, there'll be thousands of them. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. There'll be a thousand cars in a field. And right in the middle of this giant field of cars, there is headquarters, the central headquarters. And, and they, they have all kinds of competing systems. Uh, one system, of course, is the is the man flashing his lights when he comes in the end of the place. You know, you flash your lights when you want a waiter or when you want a chick to come out and the car hop. You flash your lights. You flash your lights, and they'll have a big sign. It'll say, "Flash one light, just flash it on, and leave it on when you want your tray picked up." Uh, they have a whole set of signals. Flick your lights off and on if you want the car hop to come and take an additional order. Uh, don't toot your horn. <laughs> I have a big sign. Don't toot your ridiculous horn. That is a terrible faux pas. When you're driving her, bah, bah, everybody looks, oh, who's the slob here? There is definite set of social distinctions in the drive-in world. And of course, then there's always the klutz about every third or fourth time you come there, the klutz that rolls his window up with the tray hanging on the outside, you know, with the malls. And, ah! The malts are flying in and out. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's the whole scene. I remember the time Schwartz rolled up the window. It started to rain, and Schwartz was sitting there with his gray flannel slacks, and he got a black cow all over the front of him. You know what? Is it a black cow? Yeah, that's not a that's not an Eastern drink at all, is it? Uh, yeah, oh, well, there's always a slob or two that gums his motor. You know, he comes in, he's got the double Hollywood pipes and all that, and he wants to show you that. And everyone's sitting there down on the hot dogs and the hamburgers and, and trying to make the scene with the car hops. That's a whole social, uh, a whole social sy system. It's almost, uh, it's almost a classical system out there. You're always, a, a car hop will soak for hours. If one guy, just one guy comes in and does not try to pinch her. She will sulk, you know. <laughs> You'll see her standing up there, and uh, they have they they're they're constantly competing with one another uh, as to what kind of costumes car hop should have. There's all kinds. There there's even there. I, I even saw one that that went into ancient Rome. 
There was a classical Roman one. Oh, yeah, the chicks come out there with the togas or whatever it is, those little short things, you know, the, the, the flowers and the hair and one thing and another, and carry urns and stuff full of coke and root beer out. And uh, then, then the, another one is uh, one of the more traditional ones is the Western type, where they spray the Levi's on the chicks. Uh, they have, uh, it's funny, yeah. At the, <laughs> they, uh, it, uh, it's uh, quite a thing. And when a girl gets a job out there in one of the big drive-ins, it's tantamount to making a Hollywood picture or something. It's like becoming a star. Out here, it's like being a star. As they say. And, and there is such a thing as a star waitress, uh, in most places in that area, where a waitress will really be a star. She'll have a following. And other places will compete for her. They're trying to get Agnes. You know, because Agnes has got this fantastic following. Every night, oh, that's a sad scene, boy. Uh, it really is because the guys get to know the different areas that the chicks work. You know, they have different stations in the drive-ins. And you'll see this fantastic field of concrete. You know, there'll be a giant field of concrete and all the little speakers and stuff stuck up out there. And the, the menus are up on poles, all lit up. And right in the middle of it is this little place that is the mushroom there. It's the it's central headquarters where the guys are running around with the white hats and yelling and hollering into the PA system. And you'll see this field of, of emptiness, this great field of space out there. And in front of one pl one little place, there'll be 400 cars. One place, 400 cars, and one chick running back and forth, and all the other chicks are lounging. There's nobody in their place. And, and boy, do they hate Agnes. Agnes has brought her entire following over, you see, from the You Drive It joint, or, uh, or the Black Cow. And, and they actually compete just the way they compete here, you know, the, the big producers here in, in New York will compete who's going to have uh, Barbara Streisand next season, you know, who's going to have uh, Gwen Verdun next season. There's a big, oh, there's ancients. I suspect that the day will come when car hops in the Midwest will be handled by MCA. If it's not already here, yeah, they'll have an agent, you know. What do you mean? Now, wait a minute now. She ain't going to carry no trays. What? You mean you don't have bus boys? Forget it, Mac. Forget it. Agnes, don't carry no trays. What's that? Are you kidding? Agnes only works top hours. She's only there at class A time from 8 p.m. to midnight. Yeah. And she she wants her cut off the top. Seven percent of the gross in her section, yeah. Wait, it's got to happen. Because girls can carry a business from one drive-in to the next. Did you know that? Oh, yeah, because after all, a hot dog's a hot dog. You know, what are you going to do? You know, A glass of root beer is a glass of root beer, but a car hop? <laughs> ah, ah, yeah, I tell you. And there's a whole set of aesthetics involved. There are car hop critics out there. Oh, sure. And, and, and there, you, you can see the car hops will reflect the guy who owns the place. One, one place will have these real jazzy chicks, you know, with all yellow hair, absolutely yellow hair. And they got sequins on their soul. You know, that kind with the, with the rhinestones and the, and the navel and all that. They come out. Dum, da, da, dum, da, da, dum, the chick comes out. And you can just see the guy that runs this joint. You know, he's got this 47 Mercury, you know, with the rubber tires in the back and a, the fake, uh, the fake, uh, Continental setup with the tires thing. Yeah, th th there is that type. Then there is the type of guy that has the distinguished lady type, uh, the Audrey Hepburn type of uh, car hop. And they run to a complete type. Yeah, they'll, they'll have a, uh, you never find, uh, let's say the sequin type working at a joint where the Audrey Hepburns work. And, uh, oh, it's all showbiz out. That is the showbiz. That's showbiz of the Midwest. That really is. A guy will drive uh, 75 miles to go to a, to a, to a drive-in where they have some real wild-looking chicks working. Uh, just like a guy here will, will wait four hours and wait 16 weeks to get a ticket to a show here. Same scene. Uh, it's, it's just a different kind of theater. Oh, well, here we get some more commercials here. Speaking of theater here, let's see uh, special... Uh, oh, it's Gimbel's now with the George Washington birthday thing. They're celebrating George Washington by making some dough. Almost everyone else, everything else is on sale except George Washington at six Gimbel stores. No, except cherry trees. I see. Sorry. Uh, you'll find prices hatcheted to exciting new Lolo Lolo Lows in every department. 
And today through Monday, all these buys are easy as pie, <laughs> clever there, to find at Gimbel's. Per kale sheets, twin and full, flatted and fitted, just 188. If perfect, 299 to 499. Pillowcases, just 69 cents. If perfect, a dollar twenty nine. Save plenty on coats and furs. Just look for the red ticketed merchandise, which means Gimbel's is celebrating George Washington's birthday. Buy up on the take. Uh, let's see. Uh, that's Gimbel's New York, Westchester, Valley Stream, Bay Shore, Roosevelt Field, and Garden State Plaza. Um, we sure know how to celebrate the days of our great founders in this country. Do it right. Uh, <laughs> uh, you want to hear? You want to hear more about Midwestern social mores and how they live? Uh, well, another big thing that does not seem to have the same kind of flowering here as it does out there is the automobile showroom. Uh, the automobile showroom in many Midwestern cities is the equivalent of Lincoln Center here. Uh, men will drive for hundreds of miles just to look at the showroom itself. Now, I'm not talking about the cars. It isn't the cars they're admiring. They they see these cars on all the street corners. You know, a, a car is a car. But the showroom is where the full flowering of the producer tendency that's in every one of us comes out in the Midwest. You will go into some showrooms, Matt, that are air-conditioned, beautiful, magnificent showrooms that have music playing. They have music playing out of the walls, and uh, they have girls that circulate all around, they have plush red carpets. And the, when you come into many a showroom out there, you are entering again the, 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 the field and the world of the theater. Uh, another thing that they go for out there, which we don't seem to go for much here, is the steakhouse. Uh, steakhouses are comparatively rare in New York City. And I'm talking, oh, oh we've got them. But I said comparatively rare. Uh, the idea of a steakhouse in New York, that's kind of an unusual place. People will talk about going to the steakhouse. Uh, they will talk about here in New York, you know, going to a steakhouse, a big thing. They'll go to, uh, what's that steakhouse over on 51st Street? There's several of them here in town. But for the size of the city, I'm amazed at how few steak joints we have. Uh, out in the Midwest, there are, there are hundreds of giant steak joints where they sell uh, what they call a Chicago-cut steak. Have you ever seen a Chicago steak? Do you know a place there? There's a, there's a fabulous place in the stockyards, or what used to be the stockyards, called the Stockyard Inn, where cattlemen, uh, bringing their steaks and their cows and their cattle, whatever it is they brought up from Texas, would always eat. And it's kind of a traditional place called the Stockyards Inn. Fantastic steaks, you know, like this big thing sitting there. It's got feet and ears and everything. It yells when you stick your knife into it. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, the steak is a, is a, is a not an art of New York City. Uh, I, I never was quite as disappointed as I was when I first came to New York and realized that forget the steak scene. It's just not a New York dish. And I, I don't, they, they don't do it right. It's just not a New York thing. Seafood, yes. Steaks, no. Uh, there are other things, too, which uh, I notice that are very different here in New York. Once you get west of uh, Harrisburg, you begin to see grow. Uh, one of them is the ice cream joint. Fantastic ice cream joints as you go further west. The root beer joint. Root beer is practically non-existent in, in the east. You don't get root beer here. Uh, out... Oh, sure, you get it. I'm sorry. I don't want to be, yes, you do get root beer, but you've got to look awful hard for it. You can get anything here in the Midwest or here in, in the East. But I'm talking about as a general thing. So don't make me, me so... Uh, so I always get a letter from... Well, what are you talking about? There's a place on 40 knots and somewhere you got root beer. Of course, we admit that. But you've got to look awful hard for these things. <laughs> I'm sure you can get squid here in New York. But you've got to look hard for it. You don't have to look so hard in Tokyo, right? Okay. Uh, when, you, when you get uh, out there uh, and start scratching around the, the boondocks, you'll find that the world is very different in many specific ways. Uh, and, and you get so that you miss them. Another thing that they have out there is the chili joint. You ever see the chili joints out there? Holy smokes. Uh, chili joints are on every corner and in between. Uh, and, and they have 17 different ways to fix chili. 
And I'm talking about real, to, to find a good chili joint in New York is a genuine quest in the medieval sense. I mean, you gotta go looking. And when you do find a place, it's usually decked out in pseudo phony Mexican. It's a phony Mexican joint. That's not a chili joint. And when you get in there, you, you, you get the chili and it's usually uh, very expensive, by the way, because it is so rare here in New York. So a dish of chili in New York, the, the New Yorkers don't seem to think anything of paying a buck and a half for a dish of chili. In, in the Midwest, a, 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 a schooner of chili is about a quarter. That's about all you'll ever go for it. Uh, and good, I mean real chili. I mean a real chili that's got hair on it, you know, real jumping chili, man. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I mean, it's, this is real chili. This is not just sort of weak uh, corned beef hash that's been mixed up with sort of gravy, which they call chili or a couple of beans. That, you know. uh, <laughs> I maybe maybe uh, maybe what uh, what they have out there. It isn't Mexican. They don't think of it as Mexican uh, throughout the Midwest and most of the South, which is a chili joint. That's all, and it's magnificent. The food, chili mac, boy. Do you know what chili mac is? Uh, chili mac is a, is a way of uh, fixing chili with macaroni. Chili mac. Uh, and with the uh, cheese, dried, chipped, uh, hard American cheese over the top of it that melts down into it. Holy smokes. Oh, boy. With the red beans. Oh. You just don't find that here. Now, I will concede that there are things which you could look for five years in the Midwest and never find. Out in the Midwest, uh, if a place sells a pastrami sandwich, uh, this is a fantastic rarity. Corned beef sandwich, great rarity. And people go for miles, and they will pay like $4 for a pastrami sandwich. Just like here in New York, they pay a dollar and a half for a bowl of lousy chili. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, can you imagine a New Yorker paying, say, uh, 85 cents for an egg cream? Well, that's about the equivalent of the new, of, of a Midwesterner coming east here and paying a buck and a half for a bowl of bad chili. It's, uh, it, it's just very different social, social areas there. Uh, another thing, too, that I have found is sadly lacking in New York is the pie. Uh, have you ever heard it said, you know, about the American dish when you, you read, uh, Stories uh, written, yeah, they talk about apple pie. Well, the reason apple pie is an American dish is because outside of New York, it becomes apple pie. Here in New York, it sort of tastes like yesterday's Danish. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, it just uh, this is the worst pie town in the history of the world. Uh, it's just incredibly bad pies. And they run uh, very heavily in this town. They're really not pies really here. What they are is jello pies. They, they have all this uh, gelatin and jazz in it. And, uh, it's just not pie. Thick crusts. And, uh, you know these phony pies in these joints as you go up and down uh, 42nd Street and Times Square where they have the big, thick pies that look like they're 18 feet thick? Do you ever get... Where do they get plastic apples? They're made out of plastic apples. Where do they get plastic apples? Only in New York have I ever found these. And those plastic uh, strawberries they got in New York, where do they get those? And so <laughs> there, are, there are certain things that just are not New York dishes. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this is a hamburger town. They make some great hamburgers in this town. But I can suggest other things that they don't do. Uh, for example, uh, you can't get a good freshwater fish here in town. Boy, would I like to sit down to a plate of freshwater deep-fried perch right now. Of course, in, in uh, Indiana, you can't get a, you can't get a, uh, a lobster. A lobster there, they have a thing called a mock lobster. It's made out of hamburger. There's little sticks sticking out of it. <laughs> yeah, sure, you can get it there. Well, of course, we've got mock pie in this town, so, you know, we're six of one, half dozen the other.